so yeah, uh, get set stop, but yeah, we're not gonna stop, stop just yet, we're gonna start. So those of you who are maybe some fans of science fiction probably immediately recognize this person. And those of you who are not, uh, he's kind of reading his own book on this, on this image. So if you zoom in, zoom in a little bit, you can see that this person is called Arthur C. Clarke. And Arthur C. Clarke is one of the most famous uh, science fiction authors of all time. And some of the works probably Rendezvous, Rama, Charles Huzend, and 2001 Space Odyssey, which he wrote in parallel with Stanley Kubrick's uh, movie of the same name. Now, Arthur, Arthur C. Clarke once said, and actually this is one of the so-called three laws of Arthur C. Clarke, that any sufficient advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So imagine if you could go back in time and maybe, I don't know, a thousand years back in time and you could bring this with you, right? Your, your mobile phone, probably people there would think that you are some kind of a magician, some kind of a wizard when they would see these little people living in this home because the technology of your mobile phone would be just too advanced for them to, to for them to be able to comprehend it. And you can even argue that a logical thing for them to do is would, would to assume that this is something supernatural. And this kind of uh, an event actually happened to the, to the indigenous population of these uh, South Pacific islands, not, not so far from Australia during the Second World War. So what happened is they lived a pretty much, uh, let's say a uh, technology free life there until during the Second World War, World War uh, first the Japanese airplanes and then allied airplanes came and so they would see these airplanes flying through the sky. They would uh, throw these boxes with, with parachutes because they also established bases on these islands. So the islanders, the, the, the indigenous populations of these islands, they got to observe these soldiers in their daily rituals as, as the war progressed. Now, when the war ended and the soldiers went home, an interesting phenomenon started to occur on these islands. All these cults started to appear and the leaders of these cults, they kind of claimed that those boxes that were falling from the sky, those were the gifts from gods, right? And if you follow these cult leaders, if you follow these cults, they will be able to summon the gods once again to throw their precious cargo with precious, precious goods inside. And the full story about this, this is why these cults are called cargo cults. And the full story about them is a bit more complex than this simplified version that I am giving it to you. But one thing that I, I find interesting here is this behavior that uh, the followers of these cults exhibited. So what they did is they would mimic the behavior of soldiers that they observed during the war. So they would parade with wooden replica of rifles. They would also create repli wooden replicas of airplanes and they would even mimic uh, the landing, uh, the, the airplane landing, how do you call it, the, <laughs> the, the field, yeah, the place where the airplane lands, I, I cannot remember now the, the, the exact English word, the runway, the runway for the, for the airplanes by build, uh, lighting fires and so on. And I think that this behavior, this human behavior where we mimic the behavior of others will, without actually realizing or knowing what is the exact purpose of this behavior or is there any purpose to this behavior at all, this is pretty much very widespread, widespread and we can encounter it often. And since we software developers are only humans after all, we also encounter this kind of behavior in programming and software development, and we call it cargo cult programming. Now, Wikipedia defines it as ritual inclusion of code or programming structures that serve no real purpose. In other words, you're just doing stuff like everybody else is doing it because everybody else is doing it, right? And if we are, we are to be honest, I mean, we've all been there, done that, right? At least at some point, especially maybe if, when you are like a junior developer just starting out, you just kind of want to survive and you don't have the time to like re-question every little practice you are using. You just do stuff like everybody else is doing it. And then later on in your career, as you progress, hopefully you do revisit and re-question some of the practices you are using and maybe reject some of the bad practices and keep those that are passing your test of being a good practice. Now, there is one behavior, one practice that is, I would say, deeply embedded in the hearts and minds of software developers around the world, and that is the so-called getter and setter methods. So we create our entities, and then immediately for every private property on an entity, we create these public get and set, getter and setter methods. And 
we do it for each uh, for each property and this is so so widespread that many ideas and here is the example of php storm they offer this kind of tools or shortcuts to do it for you so you don't even have to type this the code for these getters setters your id just does it for you in php storm you press this shortcut and there you have it it's really like literally automatic process but why what is the purpose of this process of this is this just is this is there some purpose to it or is this kind of this kind of ritualistic behavior that we all exhibit without thinking of it for part i think it is i think it is it does fit this cargo cult programming kind of definition so yeah i'm going to state my case tonight and hopefully i mean not hopefully but yeah maybe you'll maybe you'll agree and maybe you'll disagree but then hopefully we can have a nice discussion which is always good as long as the discussion is nice and, and civil so Let's start and take a look at the setters first. So when I say a setter, just to be clear, I mean a method like this. So you have your user entity, some private property called name, and then you have this public function set name where you take some input value and uh, assign it to the, to, the, to the value of your name property. You update the value of your property. So what's the problem here? Why would we, this be problematic? I think, I mean, we've been doing this for, for forever, right? Well. I don't know about you, but I have never heard somebody in the real world say a, per a person has set its name to another name or Mark has set his name to Tony. This is not how we talk, right? And this, this operation, this, yeah, this operation of changing your name to a different name, we have a word to describe it, right? It's called renaming, right? So if renaming is what your method does, then why not just call your method rename? And this is a small, small change with it. We just renamed our method to rename. But now, this, the, the name of this method is, is a much, it's a much more precise name. It really, it reveals, like, uh, it gives us what is the intention behind this method. When should we call this method? It really helps us to reason about the code and to know why, 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 why should we recall this method. And there's another benefit here, and that is a user and user being renamed that is a that is a domain concept we have so now this domain concept of a user who can be renamed, it is explicitly expressed in our code base and this is very good because oftentimes when we talk to when we developers or technical people we talk to the non-technical people or the domain experts the business people there's this bridge or this gap of misunderstanding where we always have to, when they say something, we have to kind of map it to our code because it's always like, oh, when they say this, that actually means this other thing in our code, we called it differently. And if, if, you, if you name your methods like this, you get this kind of shared language, shared vocabulary you can use when talking to your domain experts. And when they're talking to you, it goes vice versa. So now where your domain experts say, there's this thing called a user and the user can be renamed, you can find this domain concept explicitly expressed in your code. And this is a very, very powerful thing to bridge this gap of misunderstanding. Now, let's take a look at another example of a classic set, classic setter example. Let's say we have this entity called light for some reason, for the purpose of this example, it is an entity. And again, you have this private property and then you have this setter method and we accept the Boolean value because the light can be in like kind of two states, states it can be either on and off. So it's, it's logical to use a Boolean, Boolean value, value for that, right? Again, I have never heard somebody say, can you please set the light to off or can you please set the light to false? We don't talk like that. We just say, can you please turn the light on or turn the light off? So again, we refactor, but this time we split our one setter method into two methods. So now we have this turn on and turn off method. And again, we have this the main concept of light being able to be, you, you can turn it on, you can turn it off. Now it's explicitly expressed in our code, which is nice. But there is also another a more subtle uh, benefit that we gain by this refactoring. And that is in the first example where we had like a setter method, our light entity was actually exposing its internal uh, structure to the outside world because it was saying, hey, I have this pr private property called on and you can set it to whatever you want. I mean, we did limit it to kind of a Boolean, but still we were exposing to the outside world like what's our internal uh, structure. While in this case, our light class is only our light class, our object is saying to the outside world, well, you know, you can turn me on, you can turn me off, but what is going to happen internally, how I'm gonna internally represent this, that's 
just my business. That's none of your business and you cannot know about it. That's my private thing, right? So, and this is kind of how it should be with objects with proper encapsulation. And what happens when you are using uh, exclusive resetters is that you end up with an anemic domain model, so-called anemic domain model. And the reason why it is called anemic is because, well, there's not a lot of behavior in your, in your models. So what I mean by this, well, your user class here, it is a class. So technically it will be an object once you instantiate it, but it is behaving more as a data structure because data structures, they have data, exposed data, they have little or no behavior. On the other hand, objects, they protect their data and they only expose behavior. While your class here, which will be an object, it is technically a class and an object, but it just doesn't have any behavior. It just exposes its internal data by setter methods. And this is why it's called the limit, right? And it can get us into some trouble in like in a practical sense when we are using, when we are using this kind of model. So let's take a look at this example. So this is how you would use this entity, right? You create it and then you use these setter methods to kind of get it into a valid state because a user needs to have a name, a birth date and an address. So you use the setter methods to get it into this state and then later on you can persist it to your data storage. So what's the problem here? Well, the problem is you, once you create your user, it's already in an invalid state, right? In the first line of our code. Now, I'm sure somebody will say, well, okay, what's the big deal? I mean, in the next three lines, I just use the setter methods and again, now it's in a valid state, you save it, no problem, right? Well, that is true, but what if somebody forgets to add one setter call when he's like kind of constructing your object via the setter methods? So now somebody will save this entity and you will end up with an invalid user in your data storage. And what is even worse that can happen is somebody can load this entity and then use a setter to again push it in this kind of invalid state and violate a domain concept. So in our domain, I mean, I assume that in your domain, a user can only be born once, right? So once you're born, you get your birth date and you cannot ever change it. This is a domain concept. And here we are violating that concept by using the setter method and setting uh, the birth date to another name. So it will look like as if our user was reborn, right? And again, somebody can persist this and you end up with an invalid user in your, in your data storage. So how can we help ourselves there? We can help help ourselves by moving to a so-called more rich domain model. And the way we're gonna go about that is to not use setters as we already kind of uh, showed, but we're also gonna do something even uh, more controversial and radical. And that is, instead of using those setter methods to kind of construct our object, we are actually going to use a constructor. Some would say that this is what a constructor is there for, right? To construct your objects. So what we are doing here is we are saying, to construct a user object, you have to pass in to the constructor all the data that is necessary to have a valid user object. So now on construction time, you have to pass in the name, the birth date and the address. So this means that it will be impossible to create an invalid user because we require all the necessary data to have a valid user via the constructor. And then, it, then after that, instead of exposing all these data via setter methods, we are only going to expose those behaviors that are supported in our domain. In this case, it's a rename. You can rename a user and the user can update its address. So now when we are using this object, we can only create it in a valid state. And then after we create it in a valid state, we can only uh, call those behaviors that are supported in our domain. So this means that we cannot now use some weird combination of setters to get our object in some invalid state and then persist it. So this will, this will help us there and, and deal with those problems we can uh, get into when we are using a uh, uh, anemic domain model. So with this, we can move to getters. And again, just to be clear, when we are talking about getters, I mean something like this. So you have your user entity, it has a private uh, property address, and then you have this get address method. So you take the get prefix, you add the name of the, append the name of the property, and then you return the value of that property. And again, to be clear here, I'm gonna talk about how should you name your getters if you have them. I'm not talking about whether or not you should have your getter methods. For example, if you are doing a CQRS or and then you have your aggregates and stuff, but here I'm only talking about naming. So yeah, what's, what's the problem here? Why would this be a problem? Well, again, 
if you try to remember some situation in your life where you needed to reveal some personal, some private information about yourself, like your address, maybe you were in a bank, right? Did the bank clerk ask you, get me your address or get me your name? They didn't, right? They would just say an address. Ah, sorry for something. Yeah, they would say address or name, first name, last name, and so on. So if we remove the get prefix, I would say we lose no information in the process. And now some, some of you are probably jumping and saying, how, how do you mean? Like, we, we just, there's no get prefix. How, how can you know what this method does, right? The get prefix was telling you this will return the right. Well, the get prefix, just, it, it is just a convention. And conventions can be good, but there's something even better than a convention, and that is called a language construct. And here, there is a language construct that not only tells us that this returns an address, but it guarantees us that it returns, a, it returns an address. And that is the return type. And again, that is kind of why we have return types, right? To tell us what the method returns. And this method returns the address, which is clear from the return type. And the name address is a pretty good indicator that this method has something to, with, to do with an address. So when you see that name, you can already kind of guess, and then you see the return type, and that's it. Now you know this returns an address. So it's kind of like a getter method without the get prefix. And I would say now, before we had return types, like for example, uh, PHP didn't always have even private, public, and, and protected keyword, the access modifiers. So I think like before PHP 5, PHP didn't have it. So what people then, then did is they had this convention of naming their private methods with an underscore prefix, giving them an underscore prefix. So this would mean that you, if you want to have a private method, you give it the underscore prefix, and then you rely on the fact that you hope that other developers are going to behave nicely and they will not call this method from the outside, right? And because there was no language construct to actually declare your method private, the next best thing was to have this, uh, this uh, convention. And it, it was better than nothing, right, of course. Then PHP 5 came along, introduced public, private, and uh, protected keywords, and now you could actually declare your method private and it would actually really be private. You wouldn't have to rely on the developers behaving nicely. So there was no need for this underscore prefix convention anymore. And sure, for some time, some people still used it because it was kind of a habit of them for using it, but then they just stopped using it. And now you can rarely see it in, especially like in, in new modern PHP code. So I would say the same goes with return types. If before we had return types in PHP, you could argue that there was a need for this kind of convention where you put this get prefix so you know that, that this method just returns one value. The, 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 it's like a getter method. Now that we have return types, I think there is no need for this get prefix. It adds no new information to your method name. And if a certain prefix, a certain word, adds no new information to your method name, then it's just noise and you should remove it, right? Now, there is another thing that people will sometimes say when we talk about getters, and that is, well, yeah, but this is kind of how we talk in English. We say, get me this and get me that, right? So we should kind of use it. And actually, when you use the word get in, in English language for like, get me something, there is usually a side effect to that action. So for example, if I would tell to my girlfriend, hey, honey, can you get me a beer? She would probably, I mean, she would probably say, you know, get yourself your own beer, you, you lazy ass. But let's, let's pretend for a moment that she cannot resist me and she just gets me a beer because she loves me so much. There's a consequence for, for this action if she, she does so. And the consequence is that the, the fridge will have one beer less. And every time I call a getter and she gets me a beer, the, fr the fridge will have one beer less and one beer less. And eventually it will have no, no more beers. Now, I do agree it would be nice if fridges would obey this kind of idea we have about the world that calling a getter on an object doesn't change the internal state of this object, but they don't, right? And there's always a side effect in life when you use a getter, right? When you say, get me the keys of the car, keys will change their position, get me the car from the parking lot, parking lot has one car less, and so on. And this, I, this, this kind of convention that getters don't change the internal state of an object, it can get you into trouble when sometimes there is a side effect where, where you're using a getter, and yeah probably cause you to have some uh, bad bugs. So even this, this kind of argument, I, I think, doesn't stand up. So we should not uh, use getters because of this. So yeah, what's the conclusion? Should you, should you never ever anymore use getters or setters again? 
Of course, I'm not saying that that would be a really absolute statement and only a sit deals in an absolute and I'm not a sit, so I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is next time, maybe before you push that button to just automatically generate your getters and setters, stop, think about it. And maybe instead of having just setter methods, maybe you can give them a more, more descriptive, more domain specific names. And maybe you can even use your constructors to construct your objects instead of setters and move towards a more like a rich domain model. And yeah, when it comes to getters, I would say that we can probably ditch the, the, the get prefix, maybe give it a try and maybe, maybe you will come to like it as I did. So yeah, that's it. Thank you for your question. Thank you, thank you for any questions. I, I believe we do have some time. So yeah. Brilliant, thank you very much for that. That's, um, it's really interesting because as you say, you, you get completely stuck in these ways of doing things. And um, I've got so many objects that are just, these anemic objects with getter and setter methods. Uh, so thank you very much for that talk. If anyone's got any questions, um, if you look for the Q and A um, yeah. uh, sort of box, uh, button at the, uh, at the bottom of your screen, then you can just um, type, your, type your questions in there. Um, I, I do have a couple of questions, uh, if I may. So suppose you had um, something like in your example, address, was mutable so you, you had uh an update address method and um, so with with php 7.4 where we can specify the property type of address would you would you go as far as saying well let's forget about having an update address and an address method uh, for getting it because we're not, we're not applying any validation to it. So why not just make the property public? Um, we can still enforce by the constructor that you have to provide an address when you construct the object. But beyond that point, you could just, um, you could just have getters. You know, there's no need for the getters. There's no need for methods at all. You just access the, the, the property directly. What are your thoughts on that? Well, yeah, I would say like, that's the thing with anemic domain model, like with, and the way that I see most people using setters, they, they are basically just that. So you have a private property and then you have a set method that the only thing it does, it checks, uh, at least it checks for the type, like for in this case, maybe like in, in my case, it was like a Boolean value for that, for that, or, or maybe it's this address value. So the only thing that a setter does is, is it checks if this value you are trying to, uh, you are trying to, to assign to your property is of a correct type. So now with, with, with having like, now that you can type your prop, define a type of your properties, there's no difference between having a public property and having this kind of setter methods. So that, that is kind of like, yeah, I would say in this case, of course, I would just move, move towards private public properties. If this is really what you want your properties to be mutable, like, and then, because then again, everybody can set them like the same, like the same with the setters with the anemic domain model, you can set them to whatever. And if it's a, I don't know, some data transfer object that, that is okay to be mutable. I even go with that, like in my current like code, I just create some public properties and yeah. Use mm. it. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, if, with, uh, if there is some additional like checking and validation, like if you have some more behavior, like maybe it's you, you, are, you, you pass an address, but then you need to internally check if this address maybe is like, there's some range of checking, then you, of course, I would make it more private and then have like a nice method. But again, I wouldn't call it setter, but yeah, update address, move user, like whatever the domain word is that we are using in the domain. Yeah, cool, thank you. Um, we also have another question um, from Dan. Uh, he says, what do you say to people who say return types are visual debt? Uh, 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 yeah, well, I, if you are referring to the, I, I mean, I saw that the, the Jeffrey Bay, I think I said his name right, the Laracast, the, I mean, author, like he, he, he has Laracast like great videos there. Yeah, he had that video about, I, I saw the video and like, I realized like, I, I used to watch like I had like when I was starting out, I had a subscription to Laracast. I, I did learn a lot about, from his videos and I like like how he teaches and everything. But yeah, I, I really didn't like that video. I mean, but yeah, I mean, again, like maybe, yeah, he, he went, uh, but that's the thing. Like, I think that it's not black and white. Like I can still like 
all of his other videos and I don't have to like this one, but it doesn't mean that he's a bad guy or that he, everything he, other, other all the other things he said, it's bad. Like, I think that I, I didn't find that like the idea that he presented there with this visual depth kind of thing. I, I see some reasoning there, but I don't think it holds. Like, I think that the logic is a bit flawed. How do you say that? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm but yeah, I would not say anything. Like, I don't know if I should not. If you expected me to say that, I don't know, bash on, on, on just like, you know, yeah. I think it's okay. Okay, yeah, I mean, uh, Dan, if you want to come back, and probably it might be easier if you've got more on that, Dan, if we just add you in, then you can, you can ask us direct. Um, but in the meantime, I've got another question uh, from Mark. And he says, uh, so it seems to me these principles from domain-driven design, do you have do you have any recommendations for people, books, talks, etc., that have particularly inspired you? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's definitely like, yeah, I, I am a kind of, let's say, a fan of domain driven design. I do like tend to go in that approach. So this, this really does, does fit in nicely there with that. And yeah, well, to recommend books, yeah, I mean the classic book is the the blue book from for Eric Adams, and then the the red book from Veig Vernon, I think. But I would actually like if for people who are starting out, I would recommend another book. It's from the from Veig Vernon, yeah. So the same author author as the the red book, but he has another one that's called uh, The Main Jewel and Design Distilled, and it's it's very short. It's like like this, but it's very in my opinion, like it's a great uh, book to start. I actually read it after this one and I should have done it differently, but yeah, it's very short and it's full of like images and it's really like more like a high over, higher level overview of what domain driven design is. I think it's a great start because the, the, the blue book is a bit dry and even the red implementing during it, like even it has implementing in the title, but it's still a bit like it's big and it takes a long time to read and it's hard, yeah. So yeah, I would definitely recommend, recommend that. And there is a great lecture I watched, but I cannot remember if, if you if you ping me later on some channel, I can look it up from this guy on, on, on PHP Serbia conference. He had a great lecture about DDD. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, what we'll do, I'll, we'll, we'll, I'll catch up with you afterwards and we'll, we'll tweet um, from the PHP Southwest account uh, all, all, all the recommendations. Uh, and just obviously a reminder, if anyone wants to get a book, then they can win a 20 pound Amazon voucher by sharing a photo of them watching PHP Southwest and then you're, you're in the draw. Um, okay, so we've got some more questions. Uh, um, let me just, sorry Lee, you said there was, Lee, can I ask you to find that question? I can't immediately yeah. find it. Uh, sorry, it was from Hannah. I found that really helpful. Do we know about the difference in CPU use for the two methods described? Do I know the difference between the CPUs usage in the, yeah, to be honest, no. I, next time I would prepare like with the, with the whole uh, Michael being more eco-friendly, but yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah, if there is, a, I will try to find it for the next time. Maybe that can be an extra argument in my, in my opinion. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so Hannah's just uh, come back to this very niche question. <laughs> um, when, but yeah, no, that's, that's something to look at. I suppose you could use, um, is it eval.com where you can put in code and it gives you the, um, gives you the byte code that PHP would run? Or that, I'm not entirely sure how that, that, that yeah, would I, I watched some lectures where I think it was, uh, it was called something about the if statement from from Sebastian again I, I forgot his name a, a German a German uh, developer and there he like kind of showed how you can turn PHP into this like you said you use something and then you get kind of like more like code that looks like an assembler kind of code so there you would probably you could see like how many lines of this code you get from yeah. from your PHP code and this will probably indicate that if there's more of this then there's more like CPU work. Yeah, maybe maybe even like yeah, using using types and everything does add does add some CPU. Cycle. Yeah, I think if you, I'm pretty sure adding type hints normally normally slows everything down. I think there are exceptions, um, uh, but yeah, I think I, I think I'd rather have type hints than not. Um, and you can have also 
Yeah, I'm just yeah. waiting for Dan to tell me about type hints. Sometimes because of your dynamic code and then maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we have another question. Um, people can't always be aware that they are following a cargo cult practice. How do you check if you're falling into following some practice without understanding what the trade-offs of something are? Yeah, that's a really uh, tough question because yeah, uh, to be honest, like that's that's the problem like in life in general. How can you ever know that? I mean, you're right, but that's the thing. Like I try again, like like I I said like it goes in general for life. Never like if you never like always give any somebody a benefit of that. Like at least try to understand the the other person. Like I can disagree with somebody strongly on something, but if I can understand why their opinion is the way, like what's their reasoning, even mm -hmm. if I. Did, I think then that's like this is like if there's somebody saying like something that seems like a crazy idea or a wrong, totally wrong idea, if they have some kind of argumentation, then just listen to it and see like, okay, at least try to understand what the argumentation and then yeah. you can say, yeah, but I still don't agree with it. So yeah, one thing, yeah, you can do is not like, I don't know, whenever you see somebody who you think is wrong, don't go on Twitter and just bash on that person, maybe think about it more. And that, that's, that's a, a small mm -hmm. advice I can give. But yeah, it is kind of, yeah, hard yeah. to, sometimes we can all fall into this kind of cults. And yeah, I, I, do, I do think that sometimes we all kind of do this where you just do whatever, because you cannot re-question everything you do in life. Sometimes you have to just trust somebody else and kind of yeah. call the person, so yeah. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, until very recently, I always used getters and setters, and I, just, I didn't even think about it. I just did it. So that's what I've always done. So I'm sure, I'm sure many people. And the problem is also, like in, in, especially like in, in Symfony, like a lot of tools, they, they like uh, rely on the fact that you have getters and setters, like those serialization tools, and like Symfony forums, I think. Also. So mm -hmm. then, then you can have some kind of DTOs, but again, that adds some complexity to the mix. And yeah, so it is kind of sometimes I. I also I, I still do use getters and setters sometimes because if it's a code base where we, you have a lot of these tools and then it's just hard to like now introduce another way. So yeah. 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 Uh, well, that was um, really interesting. Thank you very much um, for that talk. I think there's definitely going to be changes I'm going to make on on how I um, how I program based uh, based based on that. And I'm sure I'm sure others might well be examining some of the, some of the practices they they do based on your talk. Um, so, uh, thank you very much.